Chris Dunganier, founder of the Conscious Education Podcast. This is a live session filmed in our Magnetic Mind Masterclass, which is a coaching program. If you hear me uh, referring to some of the guests or talking to people, this was recorded when it was live. And so you're not able to uh, comment or chat uh, to me, obviously. Enjoy this session and uh, do subscribe or share it if you think it's valuable. Bye for now. So we're going to actually use the book a bit today. Uh, and we're going to cover how we can create ineffective choices. This is, a, this is a big thing. Last week, I had multiple conversations with my team that uh, was, was frustrating because of being in reaction to, to current circumstances and not in creation. And so when you're creating, you're not doing it to get away from something, fix something. There's, there's no other reason to create other than that is what you want to have. The difficulty is for our whole life, we have only been told to create something based on solving a experience, condition, circumstance that we're not happy about. Does that mean we're not happy about something so we should do something about it? It's like we wait for there to be a problem to fix it. And, and, and then we, we learn that's how we should create. And that's, and that's the reason. And the, the conditioning is throughout all of society, everywhere in society, we are fighting things. We are fighting things. And, and let's, let's really step into to that. Uh, if, if, our, if our governments were really in the end result of creating super healthy human beings, wouldn't they be handing out vitamins rather than in improving our immune system as much as possible, rather than waiting for something to turn up and then going, oh, this is really bad. Now we need a vaccine. Isn't it true? Like if they were truly creating healthy, happy humans, there would be different things. If we were, if we were truly in creating and creating peace instead of fighting wars, we'd be doing different things. It's, it's obvious to me anyway, the world isn't in creation. The world's in problem solving. Now, the, the, the challenge with problem solving, as soon as you observe the problem, it now exists. Okay. You, you are a creative energy. Does that make sense? You are a creative spirit. You are a creative energy. As soon as you observe something, it exists. It exists. And then if you then say, well, I want to have this something, you have got two things that are fighting each other. For example, it's like if you drop uh, two stones into a pond. You drop two stones into a pond. They're going to create two different ripples. Now, if you're lucky, those ripples will be perfectly in phase. And they will perfectly match. And they will just make an amazing big wave and low troughs. And it will all work. But most of the time, it's going to it is going to be some sort of crossing out because they both have to exist in the universe. That's why problem solving such a challenge, because as soon as the problem is observed, it exists. It exists. And anything you create to get away or to solve that problem is always connected to the problem. It's always connected to the problem. So let's examine some very ineffective ways that all of us on this call have, uh, have created uh, choices and end results that have not worked, okay? And so this is from um, page 203 in my book. And, uh, and I will show you a little bit here. The first one is to resolve a negative belief. Resolve a negative belief. The first way that we create ineffective choices is we want to resolve a negative belief about ourselves. Now, th this is a very, very, very sneaky. Um, it's a very sneaky uh, um, ability of the self conscious. Because the self-conscious is actually rooted or created in an idea that we're limited. And as, as it becomes limited, as it comes and falls from grace, it falls from the, the complete all and becomes limited. As it falls to become limited, 
in that limitation, it decides what it is and what it isn't. So it decides how the world is and what's important. Typically, uh, there are six core negative beliefs that a self-conscious ego orientation is trying to resolve. Okay, the first one is not worthy. The ego, the self-conscious um, believes that I'm not worthy. So what happens if someone orients from a self-belief of I'm not worthy, instead of going for what they would truly love in their life, they go for things to become worthy of having what they would love. The way that I see this manifest the most is when someone decides they must do lots of good in the world for others. I must do lots of good in the world for others. And they believe deep down that if they do enough good, then they'll get given what they want. Now, this happened in childhood. If they were good, they were rewarded by either uh, not being abused or told off. They were rewarded with silence or they might have been rewarded with a, a present or attention. So they decided, as long as I be good and help and do things that are worthy, if I'm worthy, then I get what I want. And what happens is they get very disappointed. This person ends up resenting the people that they help. Who, who knows someone like this? They help everyone else. And then they're like, but why am I not getting what I want out of life? I just help everyone. You see, but do you see the weird belief that they have? They say, if I help everyone, then magically someone else is going to help me. But the problem is this person is, is, never feels worthy of other people's help anyway. They are the helper. It's the hardest person to help is the person that helps others. And so they spend their whole life giving, wondering why they're not getting. Who knows someone like that, by the way? They're, they're, they're like, but I've helped so many people. Why am I not rich? Uh, because money needs you to ask for it. You see, that's why, because you're not doing a money thing. <laughs> you're doing just a helping thing, which is a beautiful thing to do, but don't expect to do this to get that. I've helped all these people. Now, why is no one helping me? Well, there's no rule that because you help them, they should come around and help you. And so this person ends up becoming resentful and, and doesn't create what they love. And so just examine some of your choices. Am I... Am, am I going for what I love or am I trying to prove how worthy I am so I can finally have it? Interesting. The next one is uh, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. The, the, the person who doesn't believe that they're not good enough, uh, they try to, to focus uh, on their achievements and on work. So instead of focusing on, on other people, they focus on look at, look at what I can do. Look at what I can do. Look at my achievements. Look how good I am at school. Look how good I am at uh, sport. Look how good I am at art. Look how good I am. And, and the person who believes they're not good enough, they're not going for what they love, that they're doing something to say to everyone go, wow, you are good. So they don't actually let anyone see them. They only let people see their work. They only let people see their work. And this person can, you know, is uh is very much the uh, the Western hero at the moment, you know, but they're very empty inside. They're very empty inside. Everyone goes, wow, look at that big business you made. Look at that. I made, you're a great actor or a great musician. Look at that. But they never get seen for them. What they really would love is, you know, maybe to, to have a happy family and to connect to themselves. But they they keep thinking that they need to have work that is seen by others. Does that make sense? They feel I'm not good enough as a human uh, I need to have my work put up and it needs to be out there. I'm not good enough. So they're not going for what they love. And so then what happens is, is they're so empty inside, they're not having what they really want. And, and they get very disappointed that, yeah, they get the Academy Award and then they go, oh, well, now what do I do? And we see a lot of uh, these overachievers be very unhappy. They, don't, they didn't actually want that. They were doing it for the admiration of other people. Does that make sense? They're doing that. They're only doing it, working the amazing, crazy hours for the admiration of other people. The, the third way uh, that we're dysfunctional uh, creators is we have a belief of I don't belong. I don't belong. This orientation is very, 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 very scared 
of abandonment and rejection. Abandonment and rejection. So when they create, they first think, well, what, what if I get abandoned or rejected by doing that? And so they won't go for anything that risks that. They won't go for anything that risks it, including they might stay single for a long time because it's much safer to have an imaginary relationship. They might spend a long time thinking about releasing their art or their work, but not actually releasing it or ever finishing it because it's safer. You can't get rejected if it's in your mind or it's never completed or never finished. And so they never have what they want because they, they, they at their core, they, they feel like they don't belong. Sometimes this person, uh, you know, was moved between countries at an early age or different schools or, um, you, you know, might have been overlooked. They really, they feel as though they were always trying to find, you know, their place. Does that make sense? It's like, where, where do I fit? How do I... Uh, how, how do I fit into this world? And so that that very concerned with with um, um, being judged or rejected or anything like that. And, and so can you see how because of that they don't go for what they love? Maybe they they want to release them. They will never go against what their tribe says is the right way. Does that make sense? That they, they never will go against what their tribe says is the right way. If their tribe says, you know, that that's, this is the right way to be, it is too scary for them to challenge that. So they won't go for what they love. They'll edit it. If, they're, if they come from a family of bankers and they want to be a, um, a life coach or, you know, they just want to be a surfer in Hawaii, they're not allowed to do that. The rejection is too strong. So they don't go for what they love. Uh, they just, they just, they just uh, do what they need to do to belong. They just need to do what they need to do belong. So that's the first three. These are in no specific order, by the way. The next one is uh, a feeling of being insignificant. Number four, insignificant. I'm insignificant. This person, uh, this orientation, uh, rather than going for what they love, they want to be seen. They're trying to be seen. They always feel overlooked, not picked, neglected, not seen. So they feel insignificant. There's two ways that this person orients in their life. One, one, they have no goals. Because they're insignificant, to have goals would mean that they were significant. Does that make sense? They go, I don't really want anything, Chris. I'm happy. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything. It's like, you know, one of the questions say, well, why not just give up life then? You know, why not just give up life? What, what are you here to create? Oh, I don't really need anything, they say. The other way is they're striving so much to be seen as significant. To be seen. They were really, you know, they want to be significant. You know, this, this person wants to be the best selling author rather than to write an amazing book. Do you guys know the difference between someone who wants to be seen as amazing versus someone who actually is, is really in the work? Very, very different. Very different. Very different. So these are four. Who's learning something today? Who's revising it? Is it good? Number five. Number five is uh, I need to be perfect. I need to be perfect. I'm not perfect. And there's a way to be perfect. The I'm not perfect person sees themselves as broken and there's a way to achieve perfection. They're usually very rigid, very unchanging in their ideals, very focused on there is a right way and a wrong way to be. There is a right way and a wrong way to be. And they're not focused on what they love. They're focused on being right. This is the right way to be. This is the holy way. This is the rightest way to be. What's interesting is both Gandhi and Hitler were oriented in that belief. One amazing, this is the right way to be. One, the worst you could be. But both in the same. Does that make sense? This is the right way. That the, the, the person who truly believes in the right way 
They, they will do everything to do the right way. They won't go for what they love. There's a right way it's supposed to be, and that's it controlling right way they're typically very nearsighted as well because they only want to focus on what's right so there's a lot of the you know a lot of times it's like this is the right way i must very organized precise this is right that is wrong this is right that is wrong and they will they will stick to what's right above everything they will do what's right before they go and do what what they love and if it's if it's right to stay in a marriage even if you're not in love that's what they'll do, and they, they and they'll they'll be happy about that. Does that make sense? So they're not going for what they love because of the dysfunctional belief. And the last one is I'm not capable, or I'm not allowed to be capable. Not allowed. Either they are, I'm not capable, or I'm not allowed to be capable. Someone who's not allowed to be capable always believes that there is something outside of them that they need to fill them up to be able to achieve what they want. For example, this person never has enough time. They always say, I don't have enough time to do that. Say, I'm not, I don't have, I don't have what I need to have to create. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't know enough people. I don't have enough knowledge. So what happens is, is this person, instead of going for what they want, goes to get resources and the idea that if they had enough time or money or knowledge or people, then they can go and achieve. They're not allowed to go and have what they love the way they are. They're not able to not capable there's something they, they they end up being very smart you know and 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 going for a lot of things but they go they go the wrong way so those are the six main ones now we all orient from different ones at different times don't we don't we you know you you know you, you can be all of them but there'll be there'll be one or maybe two that really stick out it's going oh wow that's actually what i'm doing and, and when you can when you can sit and acknowledge what you're, when you really can know thyself, which is one of the basis of nearly all mystical teachings, religion, mystery schools, everything is to know thyself. When you can truly know yourself, when you can truly know your self-conscious perspective, then you can let them go. Then you can let them go. Uh, would someone, uh, one of my certified coaches, would someone type them all in? Would that be all right? I know someone knows them. Um, there are no specific order, guys, so, so there's six of them. Uh, not worthy, not good enough, uh, not capable, insignificant, need to be perfect, and I don't belong. Top of my head. Those are the six. Uh, so, so these are none of these are you being a, a, a super conscious creator. Every single time that any of those are being resolved, you are in your self-conscious uh, it's limited perspective and we all do it we all do it so today we're going to talk about just letting go of all of those and asking a different question what would i just love what would i just love because that's a good question what would I just love? What would I just love without trying to resolve any of those? So that is the first way. That is the first way that we create dysfunction. And I talk about it extensively, uh, uh, you know, in the book. The, the, second, the second way that we, we create dysfunctionally is reaction reaction when we react to a circumstance and that creates our motivation for example you go to put on your favorite skinny jeans and they don't quite fit anymore and you think right now it's time for me to go to the gym then what happens you go to the gym for a little bit lose a little bit of weight, feeling good. The motivation to keep going stops. Put the jeans on, feel good, you stop. And guess what happens? 
Well, just like the rubber band, it'll pull you right back and you end up with the same problem. You see? Reaction. Someone says, I hate my job. They react and they say, I'm going to start a business. Then they, they go start a business and they realize a business is just a hard version of a job. You see? It's, it's, it's a long time till you, till, you, till you get it successful. They go, ah, oh, that's not what I wanted. But they reacted, you see? They reacted. So, so, so reaction is a very hard one to put down because we're always in the current reality. And this is why every day you must reorient to your creations, not your reactions. Because if you react, that what, what you're trying to get away from is always there. It's the, it's, it's the motivator. So as soon as you get a little bit away from it, you, you, you've got no motivation left. It was the seed of your energy. Does that make sense? It was the it was the fire that lit the action. Many people, businesses, they don't grow to where they need to grow because the only reason for the business was to avoid something. And as soon as that angry boss isn't there anymore, then they suddenly go, well, I'm not that motivated for this thing anymore. Do I even really want it? Rather than truly being in the end result of creating an amazing thing. You see, truly creating an amazing body, truly creating an amazing relationship rather than just going, I hate this one. I'm going to jump into that one. You see, react or, or, or a one that was uh, present on our intuition call earlier, which is I, I can't be alone. I, I can't be alone. I, I, alone sucks. So I'm going to react to that and I'm just going to jump into a relationship because I'm scared of the alone thing. I can't be by myself. And so they react. And the, and the reaction ties you into it. Does that make sense? So, so that's, the, that's number two, reaction. So number one was, was avoiding a, a negative belief. Number two is reaction. Reaction. The, the third way that we actually create very ineffectively is limitation. Limitation. So limitation is not uh, is when you go for something that and you limit its success. You don't go for the true end result. You, you say things like, oh, that just enough or that will do. Or you say things that lose the truth. When you limit the truth, you say, oh, you, 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 you take all the energy out of it. Now, it's, it, limitation can sometimes get confused with specificity. Specificity is when you're very specific on what you want. Like this is, this is as you want it. Limitation is when you actually want something bigger, but you, you claim that you only want this. You say, you see, you say you want, want an amazing, amazing life experience or whatever it is, but then you say, well, well, if I could just have that, oh, just that. And the problem is, is when, you, when you limit what you truly want, when you edit your true heart desire, there's no energy in the limited, you know, you, in, instead of being in the true result of an amazing relationship that fills you up with someone you just love to be around, you, you know, just, just someone that, you know, you settle. Does that make sense? You limit it. And, and limitation, I, or I can spot a limited, um, a limited end result very easily. It's like, oh, what do you really want? And they say, oh, just this, you know, it's like, just that will do it. So now what do you really want to go for? What you really want to go for can be scary because it's, it can sound big to the ego, but it's what you really want, you know? So, so go for what you really want. That's limitation. Uh, the next one, the next one, the next one in the order of the book is others' opinions. Others' opinions. So others' opinions. You're only creating based on what other people think. You're, now, this sounds similar to, to result, trying to resolve a negative belief of I don't belong. However, it's different. This is a person that creates through consensus. When they're going to go for something, they ask everyone else what they think. You see, they never just have a decision on their own. It's like there's always a committee. And then they, they divide the committee up. Different people have different weights. And, you know, and then, then they find the average. And then that's how they decide. They're so scared of just committing themselves. They only create through consensus. 
They, they never stand on their own two feet and say, this is what I'm going to go for. This is me. I'm the creator. This is what I'm doing. It's always, what do you think to their husband or wife and you think best friend and you think mom or dad or kid or whatever it is. And they have this group. They defer all the power to the group. Does that make sense? And so they're not being powerful. And the reason why they do it is because if then the, if it doesn't work out, it's not really their fault. It was everyone else said that. You know, they just they just get to blame their friends and their family for being incorrect. You see, they don't take responsibility. Yeah, Mark says, I did that for years and disguised it as mentorship. Yeah. Please, Mr. Guru or Mrs. Guru, please tell me what I should do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> please tell me. Please tell me what what is it? What is my next? What what should I focus on in life? Because you're you're powerful, more powerful than me. Make sense, eh? So uh, they only create based on others' opinion. So anytime you're 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 choosing, and you you feel the need, well, I better what what does what do these other people think? You can still ask them. That's no problem. But if you're if you're only creating things because of what they think and what they say, you know, uh, you know, it's um, it's a challenge. <laughs> It's a challenge. Uh, okay, next one. This one is uh, one that I did a long time, a lot, um, uh, which is indirectness. Indirectness. Okay, indirectness is when we think we got to get this to get that. Who can give me an example of indirectness? I've got to have this in order to have that. I remember I had this one client one time and he came to me for business coaching and he was like, Chris, I need to, uh, I need to triple my business. I was like, all right, well, let's go. I said, why do you need to triple your business? And he said, because I need to be able to have time with my family. And the only way to do that is I need to make a lot more money so I can employ someone uh, to take my role. And I was like, okay, just humor me. Why don't you just choose to have time with your family? How could you do that? After a long conversation, we realized if he just got rid of half his clients, he has more than enough money to be able to pay the bills. He'd have way more time and he can go spend time with his kids now. There's no, there's, it, was all, it was all just this made up thing that he thought he had to do. He thought he had to go build this big thing to finally have a huge amount of money to pay off everything he needed to pay off to then finally do it. But if he just got rid of a bunch of people, kept it small and tight, and reduced his hours down massively, he could just have it now and have everything that he really wanted. Now, he didn't have to wait, but he was going indirect. And it was, it was, it was, a, very, it was a fair assumption. I mean, like it wasn't, um, as I say it, it sounds a little bit obvious, but it wasn't obvious. It was not obvious just to fire, uh, to let go of a bunch of his clients and let go of people and completely downsize. And it was completely scary to him, but it was obvious. It was obvious. It was, it was, so a lot of times we, we think we're going, we, we've got to get this to get that. But if we say, well, what if I could just go for that? What would that be like? And this is a big, a big thing when you're restructuring your life. What if I could just go for that? How would that be? How could I have that now? Instead of this, this loop that I've created to get there, we create many loops. Many people say, you know, I, I got to go lose weight before I can start um, being good on video because I need to be good on video so then I can, can do this to do, 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 do this. And they have this whole worked out situation. Instead of just saying, I want that and, go, and going for it. You know, you see it, a, you see it a lot in relationships. You see it a lot in business. You see it a lot in families. They're not just going for what they want. They're not just saying, I want to create a happy and connected family. They're saying, well, I want to have kids who get A's and B's and oh, get this. And they go, they go all of these things that are very indirect, very confusing uh, to the super conscious about what they really want because they, they're, they're only telling themselves that they want this. Makes sense? You know, a lot of people go, well, I need to make all this money so I can travel. Just choose to travel and choose what you want to do and figure out how that could be. 
you, you'll notice things that might turn up. Good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. One of my favorite uh, topics. Okay, uh, so default is the is the last one. Default. Creating through default. Default. Default is when someone opts to have no choices in life. And they just say, well, I'll just surrender. The problem is, is that if you don't have any tension in your life, you will get pulled into other people's fields and other people's tension structures, won't you? And you'll go, how did I end up here? I didn't choose this. You ended up here because you didn't choose anything. One of the worst things you can do is have nothing you're creating. Because if you've got no tension, if you're not moving towards something, you're going to get swallowed up into someone else's thing and you might not necessarily like that. Does that make sense? It's like a river. If you don't choose where the river's going to flow to, the river's just going to take you where it wants to take you. Does that make sense? So having no, having no choices. And that's called default. That's called default. So there's a summary. Now, your life is your masterpiece. You get to create it. There's nothing wrong. You don't need to react. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to fix a negative belief. You don't need to ask other people what they think you should create. It's not their responsibility. You don't need to limit it. It could be whatever it is that you want it to be, but it can't be specific. So well, this is exactly what I want it to be. It, it, it doesn't, it, there's no point having none. Because you may as well just give up life then if you don't have any and you're going to end up in some terrible places, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe you end up in great places, but, but it's not worth the risk. You need to ask yourself, without any of these edits, what would I love? 